Welcome to another edition of Mailbag. Now Mailbag is a feature of the channel where I discuss questions and comments that you guys leave on my channel. Some of them I can answer, some of them I can't, and some of the comments I feel should be shared with you. But right now, into the first mailbag item of this session. Remember, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Go over to Instagram and follow me there. Go over to Facebook, follow me there. That's where the normal notices are. And consider becoming a Patreon. And the next question or comment comes from Sean Curran. Um, I'm gonna to have to read this actually. Uh, only only because of my eyesight is, I don't know what it is, but the last couple of days, getting to this time of the evening, I'm really kind of struggling with concentration, so I do apologize. Um, he writes, the P17 soundtrack patch sounds like the intro to Forever Young by Alphaville. Hopefully people know that song. Forever Young, yeah. Okay, the song released about the same year the JX8P came out. I'm sure there are dozens of songs from the mid to late 80s that used this, this sound. I was surprised, based on product overlap, the D50 version of this patch is so different. I prefer the sounds of the JX8P. And this was in response to uh, a video I did uh, in d -d -d May. Uh, 2021, which was exploring the JX8P. In fact, I've done a whole series of videos on the JX8P. Some people may love them, some people may hate them, but I actually quite enjoyed my uh, few weeks with the JX8P. Um, and what's really interesting about the comment here is that both the, the JX8P and the D50 um, suffered, no, suffered's the wrong word, benefited is the right word, um, from the programming skills of a certain Eric Persin. Um, and he basically did a lot of the base programming for both those particular synthesizers, which is not surprising because he was in the Yoda, he was in the, um, no, I was gonna say the Yoda stable, the Roland stable, I don't know how Yoda got into that, um, but he was in the um, Roland stable in that sort of mid to late 80s period doing a number of pieces for them. Um, so what I've done is I, I listened through to the uh, Forever Young and you know the bottom line is he might be right. Um, it's very close but I suspect that this patch was from the JX3P and not the 8P and the reason for that is that it, the, da, 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 the 8P was released in 85 and the song by uh, Alphaville was actually released in 84. So that means that song was probably recorded at some point in 84 or some point in 83. So the the 8P wouldn't have been around. And while some artists um, do get pre-production releases of machines, and I'm thinking fairly recently about things like Kibu, who did all the promotional stuff for the Jupiter X for Roland, you know, he released one of those machines, he was given one of those machines fairly early on and went away and wrote a whole bunch of stuff and uh, custom sounds based on that keyboard. Um, and he also is a very, very prolific JX8P user, by the way. Um, but I don't think Alphaville were probably big enough a band at that point in time to benefit from a pre-production uh, version of the 8P. And I suspect whoever was their synth tech at the time I don't know much about Alphaville, so I don't know whether their keyboard player was, was the main programmer or whether they had a synth tech in there as well, um, doing the work. Many bands around this time would have had a production, not the way we understand production today, but production being done uh, with things like sounds, etc. Um, so I don't think they would have had been big enough to actually have uh, that style of engagement with Roland. There may have been one in the studios that they were working in, but I doubt it. So I think that's probably a um, probably a three P. Now this brings on to a side here, which is um, there are numerous stories of artists 
being given pre-production versions of synthesizers and refusing to give them back to the uh, the synth manufacturer because they love it so much. Um, if you go if you go search on the internet, you can find some of these. I mean, I did actually write one down, and of course, I came in to record this, and I can't find the piece of paper that I wrote uh, a good example down. So, um, and it's completely gone out of my head. So. Uh, apologies for that, but they, there are numerous stories of, of artists not giving back the synthesizer because they love the sound so much. And given the fact that they're also pre-production means that they probably wouldn't be able to be upgraded as easily as the production in terms of unplugging EEPROMs, etc. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Sean. And the next one comes from Tim. And this is in response to, again, just done a video about will we ever see the RD9, um, a SMR I did in April 2021. And Tim writes, no need for this one. The TR8 is miles better, faster to use, more sounds, 808, 909, 606, 707, uh, no more zaps and pops. Who needs the 909 nowadays anyway? And Tim, you could well be true on that statement. Um, and I can't argue with that viewpoint because the reality is the TR, Roland TR8 does give you all of these classic sounds um, of the Legacy TR series. I mean, that's what the TR8 was designed to do. It was designed to give you those sounds but not reproduce the original units. And I have one and I can agree with that. But it doesn't stop me wanting <laughs> the RD9. And I put that response back to Tim. And he wrote back and said, um, GAS, fun but ir irrational. I know it is fun but irrational. Um, I too want everything, but there's no point or enough space. The 909 is really cool with samples. It's not as playable, as fun as the TR8. Hands down, the TR8 is a winner. RD6, RD8, RD9 are redundant, so the so is the Isler instruments. I sent back my RD my RD8 back, too slow to my, to use. My DR, DRM Mark II doesn't get turned on much easier. TR8 does it all, and my MPCs are full of samples of the, for the rest. I find I find it quaint that Behringer is doing these reissues, but let's face it, there's better stuff on the market for those now. Uh, <laughs> And um, I didn't actually respond to that, but then another tuber came in and responded and said, I completely disagree. This is little G. The RD8 sounds a whole lot better than TR8 to my ears, and so does the RD6. Yes, the TR8 has more sounds, and they are very good, but it definitely is a need for an RD9, just like the RD8 and the RD6. <laughs> and I'm going to kind of sum this up. And it, and it comes back, I'll, I'll give you another analogy, right? So somebody turned around at me and said, is the Oasis better than the Kronos? Is the sound of the Oasis better than the Kronos? And I said, for me, the Kronos is, a better, is better than the, the Oasis, but as a workstation. Now, some of the sounds and the keyboard on the Oasis is definitely better than the keyboard on the Kronos, right? Hands down. Right? And this is kind of into the same thing. It's personal preference. Behringer has spotted the market and it's personal preference, they're marketing into that market. It's much the same as selling selling you know face cream to your 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 better half. Right? The cosmetics company make you feel that you need face cream because you've got wrinkles. Now I'm, I'm not going to get involved in that conversation, but you get my drift. So Behringer and the music industry say you need an RD9 because you want that legacy sound. And we'll leave. Thank you.